All right, welcome back everyone. We're going to continue the discussion about rocks um, and petrology. So uh, next we'll talk about sedimentary rocks. These are some of my favorite rocks. Um, you can see here the wave, um, which is a, a sedimentary rock formed from Navajo sandstones. So sedimentary rocks are rocks formed uh, from cementation of sediments. So when you have fragments of rock that get um, smushed together and form a new rock. So um, sedimentary rocks follow rules laid out um, called Steno's laws. Uh, so there's five different laws, the first being the law of superposition, which just means that a layer um, on top of another layer is usually younger um, than the one below it. Um, because it was deposited on top of it, that layer much, must be younger. Um, the second law is the law of original horizontality, which means that sediment um, was originally deposited um, in a flat orientation. Um, and if you find uh, sediment layers that are tilted, that tilting must have occurred after the deposition. Then third, um, we have the law of cross-cutting relationships, um, which says that if you have um, an intrusive layer that cuts through sedimentary layers, such as a dike or a sill, that um, intrusive layer must be younger than the material that it's cutting into. Um, you can't just have it cutting into nothing and the sediment forming around it. Um, and then the last law um, is the law of lateral continuity, which basically says that uh, sedimentary layers rarely just end, um, and usually um, they must end by um, getting cut off by, by another um, rock body um, or some other process. Um, and so sedimentary rocks form um, first by uh, formation of sediment. So you have to have erosion that turns the bedrock um, into sediment. And then you have the transport of that material, either by a river or some other process. And then you have deposition, maybe at the ocean floor. And then um, as more and more of that sediment um, piles on top of it, then you have compaction. And then finally, cementation, when these um, sediment grains finally fuse together. So um, a sediment can, a sedimentary rock can either be uh, grain or matrix supported. So um, the, the matrix is the material that actually causes the cementation to occur. Um, this can be calcium carbonate, for example. Um, and so a matrix supported sedimentary rock has uh, a lot of matrix material and the grains don't necessarily touch each other. Whereas grain supported um, sedimentary rocks, the, the sediment grains are touching each other in the, the matrix just kind of fills the void spaces between them. We can tell the age or the maturity of a grain within a sedimentary rock based off of um, a number of different uh, properties of that rock. And so um, generally as a sediment grain uh, is transported further away from its source, it becomes finer and finer. So that rock uh, and sediment breaks apart into finer pieces. And so the older the sediment grain, usually the finer it is. Additionally, um, all the angles and harsh edges that it had at formation tend to be um, eroded away. And so the more round a sediment grain is, the, the older it is as well. Uh, and because um, different processes that move the sediment tend to sort the grains into different sizes. Uh, the older the sediment grains, usually the more well sorted they are as well. And so um, the different grain sizes um, can cement and form different types of rock. So um, gravels and larger particles um, that form into a sedimentary rock, form a rock called a conglomerate, uh, whereas sand forms into sandstone, silt into siltstone, 
and mud um, and clays into mudstones and shales. So there's two different type of rock that forms from gravel. There's the conglomerates um, that I just talked about that form from well-rounded um, older sediments, um, whereas breccias um, form from angular um, recently formed sediments. And so, for example, you could have a breccia that forms um, from landslide material, um, whereas usually a conglomerate would be from material that's been transported and the, the grains more rounded. Um, so in terms of the distribution of sedimentary rocks throughout um, the crust, the majority of sedimentary rocks are shale. So those are um, sediment sedimentary rocks formed from uh, fine-grained muds and, uh, uh, and clays. Whereas 22% um, are limestones, so th th those are sedimentary rocks formed from carbonates that we just talked about and shells being deposited on the ocean floor and getting um, cemented into a sedimentary layer. And then most of the rest of the material is, is sandstone that's been um, cemented together. Uh, so when you have the formation of these sedimentary beds, these sedimentary layers that develop as um, more layers of sediment get deposited and cemented together, then you can have folding occur. And so there's a number of different types of uh, folds that can occur. Um, when you have a curved surface um, and um, the top axis is on top of um, the folded material, and we call that an anticline. You can think of um, an anticline has an A-shaped curve um, like this, whereas a syncline has a U-shaped curve and is uh, concave upwards um, versus concave down. So we have anticlines and synclines. And then we also have recumbent folds, which is when a fold gets so extreme that it bends over and folds on top of itself um, and forms this S shape uh, as a result. You can see that here you have the anticlines and right here and here uh, and the syncline right here forming this, this upward shaping Q. Next we're going to talk about metamorphic rocks. So this is a beautiful location um, near my field site in Greenland where we have a lot of metamorphic rocks at the edge of the Russell Glacier. Um, so metamorphic rocks are rocks that form under very high pressure. So um, when a rock is exposed to heat and temperature, um, it can form a recrystallization and form a different type of rock, such as uh, a gneiss or a schist, like this guy here. Um, so um, what happens when a rock undergoes uh, extensive heat and pressure is that the um, crystals within that rock start to reorient and, and form new crystals. Um, so, for example, this is a granite that we just talked about, um, which is an intrusive igneous rock. But after it's undergone significant amount of stress and pressure, those crystals get oriented with each other um, and so you form these layers here and this is a nice um, g-n-e-i-s-s -S, nice um, and so the type of metamorphic rock that forms depends on the material that it originally started from so sandstones if it undergoes um, light metamorphism will turn into quartzite Limestone will t turn into marble, like maybe you have on a fancy countertop. Um, and then mudstones will turn into slate. Um, there's a number of different types of metamorphism, um, that a uh, number of processes that can cause enough temperature and pressure to um, alter the crystal structure of, of a rock without completely melting it. Uh, the first being regional metamorphism. You can see that here. Uh, and remember, we talked about continent to continent 
um, convergent plate boundaries, such as India colliding um, with the Asian uh, plate. And so in that scenario, you have so much pressure that builds up as these two tectonic plates smash into each other that you can have metamorphism that results. Uh, the next type of metamorphism that can occur is seafloor metamorphism. So at a mid-ocean uh, mid ridge, such as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, you have a lot of very hot uh, magma coming near the surface um, and it can dispense that heat to the surrounding rock. And sometimes that heat, along with the fact that there's a lot of water that can seep in, can change the, uh, the crystal properties of that rock and metamorphose it. Uh, next, we have contact metamorphism. So when you have um, a hot magma plume coming up, um, such as in a convergent plate boundary that's uh, forming an, an island arc, for example, or a batholith um, for an intrusive igneous rock, um, some of that heat from the magna plume will um, get to uh, hit the surrounding rock and will cause it to metamorphose. So a lot of times um, around the boundary of this batholith or this magna plume, then you have contact metamorphism occurring. Next, we have shock metamorphism. This is the metamorphism that causes shocked quartz that we talked about previously. So when you have a meteorite that comes down, it's traveling at tremendous speed, and when it smacks into the ground, um, the rock below it can form uh, metamorphic rock. And then um, lastly, we have burial metamorphism. So when you have um, rock that's been de uh, deposited um, millions of years ago and, and you have layers and layers and layers of rock that's depositing above it, eventually that rock will um, start to have so much pressure on it and it'll be so um, close to the uh, upper mantle that it will start to um, metamorphose because it's got all that pressure um, and, and temperature. So there are different grades that we um, consider metamorphosis, metamorphosis to occur at. So uh, diagenesis is just the um, process in which uh, sedimentary rocks form um, and can actually cement um, due to um, pressure binding the, those grains together. But above that, you start to get metamorphism. And for example, above around 200 degrees Celsius and um, uh, pressures around 400 megapascals, you start to get low grade metamorphism. And then as you get to hotter temperatures and hotter pressures, um, you start to get into intermediate grades and then high grade metamorphism. And the rocks that result from these different um, grades of metamorphism can be seen here. So um, low grade metamorphism, for example, can change a mudstone into a shale. Um, and then as you get to more um, pressure and higher temperatures, the, that shale will compress into a platy slate. Um, and then um, if you increase the pressure, you can get blue schist, or if you increase the temperature, you can get green schist. Um, so at that point, instead of just orienting the, the grains now, you're starting to get new um, minerals that are crystallizing um, because of that high temperature and, and pressure, um, such as uh, micas that start to develop in schists. And then as you get into even higher temperatures and pressures, you start to form gneiss and migmatite, in which um, there's so much pressure that these layers of different minerals start to separate from them, themselves and you have um, these, this banding occurring. Uh, you can see an example of a schist here, and then here is an example of a, of a gneiss where you have this banding of more uniform um, crystals because it's been exposed to so much pressure. 
Uh, per, a porphyroblast is um, a crystal that develops within a metamorphic rock because of that crystal structure is a little bit easier um, to crystallize than um, the surrounding material around it. And so um, a good example of this is this large garnet. Um, garnet um, is fairly easy to crystallize um, within at that process of metamorphosism, and so you can have these larger crystals develop um, within the rock. So um, lastly, we're going to talk about the geology of New Jersey. Um, there's some really interesting geology that occurs um, right here in the state um, that uh, can have a big impact on the, the, all of us that live here. So um, New Jersey does have some intrusive igneous rocks. So we have um, some volcanic surface flows that are still exposed um, in the northern part of the state. You can see that in here in red, as well as some sills that have uh, that now develop the um, kind of more uh, mountainous hillside that make up the, the Hudson River Valley. Um, there's also faults within New Jersey, um, geologic faults, um, never, never actual faults. Um, so the biggest fault is the, the Rampo fault, so that, that runs kind of at the southern um, edge of Appalachia, um, and it breaks off into the Flemington fault and the Hopewell fault that's not far from the um, Rutgers campus. Uh, and so that fault, the Ramapo fault, is a normal fault that we talked about in the previous lecture where um, the hanging wall is falling rel relative to the foot wall. And that's bringing um, a bunch of sandstones um, next to um, the, the schists and, and granite uh, and gneisses um, that are on the other side of the fault. Um, this fault has created some earthquakes. Um, New York and northern New Jersey are not uh, completely earthquake free. These are all of the earthquakes that have occurred in New Jersey um, since 1924 and since 1975 um, that are uh, magnitude three or greater. So not huge earthquakes by um, California standards, for example, um, but there, there's still earthquakes that happen because of this fault um, moving um, through New Jersey. So that just about wraps it up. Um, so in summary, we talked today about um, different minerals, including feldspar, quartz, olivine, carbonates, and micas. Um, I will say that our random phrase for um, this week is that the jewels were from Kansas. The jewels were from Kansas. All right. Um, and so we also talked about uh, different rock types, including um, intrusive igneous rocks and extrusive igneous rocks, as well as sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks. And then we just talked about some of the geology in New Jersey. So thank you everyone for watching and I will see you next time.